local advisory committee uh, was talking about this event for you know a, a good year and a half, brainstorming and um, narrowing down what they wanted to do. And I'm just so proud um, to be able to combine our events and and have uh, have this happen today. So. Um, the, the, the afternoon is all theirs uh, with their passion and engagement. And I, I just did want to uh, thank, of course, Associate Professor Ruben Roth, who's going to be your moderator and take over here from the Workplace and Labor Studies Program, uh, the School of Northern and Community Services with Laurentian University. Um, and also Andy Latticer, um, who's our chair of the Local Advisory Committee. Um, um, Susan uh, Hart, who you saw this morning uh, from OWA, Mallory Leduc from CROSH, uh, Patricia Strew from the Workers' Health and Safety Center, and now our community member because she's off to greener pastures of retirement, I think, soon. Um, Eli Martell, who needs no uh, introduction. Sean McMahon uh, with the Sudbury District Labor Council, and uh, Dwight Harper is here, was here with us. Uh, and Donna Campbell, your former executive director. So um, really uh, just handing over the afternoon uh, and, and thanking the local advisory committee for helping us get the culture of the community and the, the drum ceremony this morning and this event. And um, without further ado, Ruben Roth. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, my name's Ruben Roth. I'm a faculty member at the Workplace and Labor Studies Program at Laurentian University. I'm going to keep this uh, hopefully quick, but probably not quick enough. Um, before I introduce my panelists, our panelists, uh, let me just explain. I'm, I'm one of over a dozen. We keep, uh, we keep getting new people and losing people, so uh, I'm one. <laughs> It, we're around a dozen LAC members. The LAC is the Local Advisory Committee of the uh, Occupational Health Clinic for Ontario Workers. Uh, we are the eyes and ears in the community, so to speak. Um, and, and we've devoted uh, about two years, I think, uh, possibly three if, if we uh, get at it, uh, to uh, what would eventually become today's panel. Um, let me just say that I'd like to acknowledge the assistance of Laurentian personally and my dean, Dr. Joelle Dickinson, who uh, I'm on sabbatical and, and uh, she's been very helpful uh, during this time. I'd like to thank, of course, the executive director of uh, the Sudbury Clinic, Kimberly O'Connell. Uh, without Kimberly's support and uh, staff support, we wouldn't be here today. Um, OCAL staffers Brittany and Trevor are pivotal in organizing the day's events, as well as all the OCAO staff who played a role in organizing the day. Um, I, I don't want to thank each LAC member by name, but there were several of us who uh, participated in planning meetings for over two years. They include Susan Hart, who you heard from this morning, our, our co-chair, Michelle Seguin, our recording secretary and committee members, uh, Pat Strew, Mallory Leduc, Donna Campbell, Christine Kelly, Chad Maycomb, Andy LaDuceur, our chair, and Eli Martell. Uh, Kimberly said Eli doesn't need an introduction. Let me introduce Eli for those who are uh, online at the webinar. Um, Eli is uh, the, uh, was the NDP critic for occupational health and safety at our uh, provincial legislature at Queen's Park about 30 years ago. Um, and he's yet to give up the critic's role even though uh, he, he left as the member of uh, provincial parliament in 1987. Uh, he spent 20 years at Queen's Park. Uh, representing Sudbury East. Um, as I said, Eli never took off his critic's hat, uh, and, and without Eli's uh, determination, let me say dogged determination, um, his unwavering dedication uh, to workers, his often frustrating questions, his sheer pushiness, uh, without all of that this afternoon probably uh, would not have happened. Eli pushed us all. He certainly pushed me to ask the right questions. Um, of course, I want to thank our panelists, who I'll introduce in just a, a minute or two. Our, our format is as follows. Uh, I'll pose a question to uh, one or several panelists, and when they're tired of asking the question and they've exhausted the question in themselves, um, others uh, can weigh in. Um, I've got too many questions. If, if we get three or four done today, I think we're, uh, we're zooming. 
Um, I've shared my questions with the panelists it's, uh, so they can prepare a reasoned response. Uh, we're going to end at 3 o'clock. Uh, for those of you who are looking at your watch, it's, it's a, a hard end, I'm told. Um, and before we reach that end, uh, I'm going to leave the last 20 or 30 minutes uh, for the audience. Uh, to ask questions, both here and online. Uh, so uh, by all means, prepare a, uh, a question, uh, uh, jot one down in front of you so you're ready for it. Um, now, uh, here's how we got to this place. Um, in around 2017, which actually means three years or so, um, I, I reported to the LAC, I came across a report uh, by a legal firm that announced their victory from their standpoint. Uh, they were an employer-side legal firm. Uh, they announced their victory in weakening several key decisions made by provincial workplace health and safety inspectors. There's no point in naming the law firm. There are dozens of them, hundreds, across the country. Um, but here's what they concluded. They said the Ontario Labor Relations Board found that overruling this inspector's decision struck an appropriate balance between the risk of harm on the one hand and the ability to carry out business on the other. The risk of harm is balanced on one hand and the ability to carry out business is on the other. That's the balance, those are the scales. Well, as workers or worker representatives, um, we know where that puts us uh, or those of us who are concerned. Um, this firm's task is aimed at minimizing the financial impact of an inspector's decision regarding the health and safety of a workplace. Uh, we found this collectively, the LAC found this to be a maddening approach to ensuring the health and safety of a workforce. I'm sure many of you agree with me, right? Um, whether it's chemical or musculoskeletal or accident or injury prevention or, or RSI or uh, carcinogens, the, the approach and counter approach resembles a game far too closely. And the stakes are too high to play a game with workers' lives. So again, and I know I sound terribly naive to a lot of you, but at the risk of sounding naive, I found that flesh and blood workers were obviously missing from the picture. They're not in the calculus. Um, and, and around this time, I teach a course called, uh, it's a long title, The Social, Political, and Economic Landscapes of Occupational Health and Safety. There's no way of shortening that I can, I can think of. Um, but uh, my, my research took me to an article by an American named Jordan Barab, and he wrote, why does society take the death on the job of some people more seriously than that of others? He wrote, the, death, the deaths of astronauts and soldiers are greeted with great concern by opinion leaders who vow that they will not be tolerated, but the deaths of day laborers or other blue-collar workers seems to be accepted as an inevitable act of nature. This double standard of death is reinforced by the divided, the bifurcated way that the mass media frames the issue. So what I've laid out so far tells a story. It's, it's, it's kind of the path that the LAC took. Um, we kept coming up with more data, more arguments. Uh, we started, I started collecting and sending out uh, fines of 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 for worker injury or death. Those are the $100,000 ones. You know, from the worker's standpoint, um, uh, this can't be the situation. It, it's, uh, it represents a list of degraded, debased circumstances uh, that, that uh, collectively comprise workers' health and safety experience in, in the workplace. We have inadequate regulations. We have poor enforcement subject to the maintenance of so-called reasonable profit margins. We have embarrassingly low fines with no teeth and inadequate compensation based on biased actuarial tables. That's just the start. I could go on. Th these all reflect the very sad fact that workers' lives aren't worth very much, especially when compared to that of a, an astronaut or a CEO or a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant or a university professor. The, the, you know, the, this is a demeaning condition uh, for Ontario workers. It's barely better than that of a 19th century English mill hand. So, uh, look, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not under the illusion that we're going to come to any profound answers today. 
Um, I'm, you know, I, I, one promise I can make is we'll probably satisfy absolutely nobody here today. Um, I promise you that. Uh, but what we hope to do is provoke a conversation and continue that conversation. Uh, I hope we take it with us wherever we go. I'm going to introduce our panelists. That's, that's my bit. I'm, uh, now I'm just going to ask questions and get out of the way. Um, our panelists are, let me, uh, because his head is looming above us, uh, about 10 feet high, uh, this is Dr. Bob Barnetson. He's a professor of labor relations at Athabasca University in Alberta. Bob is an active trade unionist, a member of his university's Occupational Health and Safety Committee. He's the author of a book called The Political Economy of Workplace Health in Canada. Uh, which was published in 2010, and he's co-author of Health and Safety in Canadian Workplaces, published in 2016. Both are available on the Athabasca University website uh, in PDFs, um, and uh, maybe we'll make that, uh, if, you, if you Google the titles or Bob's name, you'll come across the uh, publication page. Uh, so welcome, Bob. Um, Stephen Biddle is over there at the end. He's an associate professor of criminology at the University of Ottawa. Thank you for coming all this way in this weather. His research and teaching interests include uh, crimes of the powerful, corporate crime, corporate criminal liability, safety crimes, which is an interesting category, and the sociology of law. He has a long list of publications, including Still Dying for a Living, Corporate Criminal Liability After the West Ray Mining Disaster. Um, what brought Stephen uh, to our attention is his article, Work-Related Deaths in Canada, which is in Labour Le Travail in the fall of 2018, which he co-wrote with uh, Chen and Hebert. Uh, so welcome, Stephen. Um, next to Stephen, we have J.P. Morochuk. He's currently a full-time uh, WSIB uh, Worker Safety and Insurance Board for those on the webinar. Uh, WSIB worker advocate for the United Steelworkers, Local 6500. He has specialized knowledge of occupational disease in the nickel producing industry. Um, and uh, JP has also actively lobbied the Ontario government uh, to protection benefits for WSIB widows of occupational disease victims and for the protections of benefits for retired COPD victims. So welcome JP. Uh, next to JP, we have Janice Martel, uh, who is an occupational health coordinator at OCAO. In April 2015, Janice founded the McIntyre Powder Project. Their brochures are on the front table. Um, and the McIntyre Powder Project uh, created a voluntary, Janice created a voluntary registry to document health issues in mine workers, including her father, Jim Hobbs. Uh, these workers were historically exposed to compulsory aluminum inhalation under the McIntyre uh, powder program. Janice is a strong advocate for workers' compensation system reform, particularly for occupational diseases. And um, next to uh, Janice is Paul Demer, who you've met already, the director of the Occupational Cancer Research Center based in Ontario Health, and a professor with the Dalla Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. He has a PhD in epidemiology and as he told you, master's degree in occupational hygiene and his research, which you saw earlier prior to lunch, focuses primarily on occupational cancer and other diseases. Um, he's been a member of many national and international expert committees dealing with occupational cancer. Um, now that I've introduced all of you and I, I've made your self-introductions a little shorter, uh, I hope, uh, did, uh, we're going to start with Paul and go down. Uh, did, uh, you were each... You each wanted to. You're in the hot seat. Uh, you wanted to just say a couple of words, a minute or two, about your own research. Yeah, I can easily do that. People have probably heard more than they would want to from me already today. But uh, my research is kind of in three broad areas. One is looking at the causes, uh, the causes of cancer and other kinds of diseases. Uh, mostly historically that's been uh, lung diseases which are often caused by the same things as uh, as cancers um, also I uh, do a lot of work in trying to uh, set up systems to uh, track uh, patterns and trends in different types of, of uh, work-related diseases uh, and so set up uh, systems for that uh, with the idea of generating the kind of data to uh, help target prevention efforts, um, uh, and then as well, prevention-related uh, research is my third area. 
Uh, and uh, that's probably about enough to say uh, for that. Janice? I'm Janice Martell. Janice Hobbs Martell was my uh, maiden name. My dad, Jim Hobbs, was an underground miner in Elliott Lake. He was actually at the nickel mines here in Sudbury. And uh, like Paul DeMers' slide that you saw earlier, at times they went from nickel mining to uranium mining. And, and uh, he went to the mines in Elliott Lake. And when he was up there, he had to inhale um, a toxic substance, uh, McIntyre powder, finely ground aluminum, aluminum oxide. And um, it was part of his daily routine. Uh, it was forced. You got locked in a room and you sat beside your mining brothers basically at that time and uh, you had to inhale aluminum dust because um, the people who brought it in who were mining executives and industry doctors, um, it was their answer to compensation costs uh, from silicosis because they operated on the theory that if you inhaled this into your lungs, um, it would affect the solubility of silica and it wouldn't deposit into your lungs causing scarring and causing the lung disease silicosis. Um, my dad ended up with Parkinson's and when I found out about the aluminum dust, because he, he, didn't, he didn't talk about it when he was in the mines, um, we started a compensation claim for him. It got denied, appealed, denied. Um, and we were at the tribunal level when I realized, and I, w I was his worker representative, um, when I realized that you could not win because the compensation board had developed a policy that automatically denied any uh, association between um, uh, between any kind of neurological disorders uh, caused by occupational aluminum exposure. Um, so when we withdrew his claim, I realized that the system was uh, an, an issue and that we had to change the system. And you couldn't change the system from the inside because you could just do these individual claims that would go in, they would get denied individually and nobody would know the difference. So when we withdrew it, I asked my dad's permission to tell his story to be able to um, push for this and to get things changed and go outside of the system. And that has been quite effective um, in doing that because when you start gathering outside of the system, how many other people were exposed? What kinds of health issues did they have? It creates the, um, the numbers that Paul was talking about earlier um, to change the system and that's what we're doing. And you will change your mind by the end of this, Ruben, <laughs> I have faith. <laughs> I hope so, uh, yeah. JP. It's always tough to follow Janice, you know that. Either. Well, personally, myself, I'm, uh, I'm third generation in, in the mining uh, industry. My um, great, my grandfathers, uh, and including my grandfather-in-laws, I guess, were all in, in the mining industry, both my father and father-in-law, and, and I got in in the, the late 90s. And I have three boys, uh, two of which are, are underground now. So mining is very much part of of uh, the fabric of, of Sudbury. Um, and we, we talk about harm and we talk about the, the, the risk, all of that stuff, but really at the end of the day, people really need to work. So the ideal is not to stop to work, but the ideal is how to make the workplace safe so we could all benefit from, from that. So um, when I was first hired on, I, I uh, got onto the health and safety committee and health and safety is an interesting topic because it's, it's a moving target. You can't specialize in all aspects of safety. Um, so our committee at the time, each one of us had to take on an issue and the issue that I took on was asbestos abatement. Um, the plant that I was working at was built in the 70s and then of course asbestos was very prominent in, in the early 70s. And as time went on, uh, the asbestos didn't go away, it actually deteriorated and here we are 20, 30 years later and you have to take care of that. You have to remove that and how do you do that safely to protect the workers that are removing it but also the people that are in that plant working. So I, I specialized in that. From there I moved on to uh, safety investigations and, and the um, 6500, we, we kind of hijacked the techniques that the Canadian Safety Transportation Board applies when they investigate trains and planes and all of that stuff. We stole their methods and we applied it into the industrial world and it really opened my eyes to a lot of things when we talk about health and safety. And I did about 12 or so investigations, and we call them significant investigations. And all 12, every single one of them, it was never the fault of the worker. The worker that got injured it was never his fault. There was always a system failure in place that allowed that condition to happen. 
So these investigations really looked at system failures and it really opened my eyes to a lot of things. So from there I progressed into the WSIB world uh, in 2006. Because of my interest in, in uh, asbestos, the, the union thought, and, and the union promotes within, we're all, we all carry lunch pails, and, and I say that in, with a great deal of respect, and, and that really is to say the blue collar workers. We promote within, and, and because of my interest with asbestos, I right away was trained in Oc disease, and what we're gonna talk about today is, is really just the tip of the iceberg, and, and how do we get beyond that, but really the focus around Oc disease is is uh, tough, but we don't have to make it tough, and I hope we can kind of dive into that. Mm -hmm. But that's that's my life in a nutshell, uh, Ruben. Thank you, JP. <laughs> Steve, I'm going to ask you to hold on. I'm going to go to Bob, who who's probably sitting and wondering when we're going to get to him. Um, and you're going to kick off our first question, Steve. So, uh, Bob, go ahead. <laughs> and we need audio. Bob, we have no audio. How's that? Is that a little better? Louder? <laughs> I mean, these guys, not you. Yes, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> sure. My name's Bob. Uh, I teach labor stuff at Athabasca University. Uh, Athabasca University is a publicly funded distance education institution. Uh, and that means uh, basically we all work from home in our basement uh, in our underwear. Uh, we don't put that on the brochure. Uh, but that is uh, the reality of uh, work here. Uh, and I mention that only because it's teachers convention here at Edmonton today, so I'm not home alone. Uh, and if I have to duck out, it's because I need to prevent an injury in the basement. Um, my research is around the political economy of uh, workplace injury in Canada. Uh, and that's the fancy words I use uh, when I'm trying to get the government to fund it. Really what my research is about uh, is this discrepancy uh, that on the, on the one hand we have laws uh, to prevent workplace injury uh, that seem to be pretty good uh, when you look at them on the face of them. And yet, uh, on the other hand, we have an incredibly high level of workplace injury uh, in Canada's workplaces. So really what I'm interested in is, is what gives uh, with that, uh, and more uh, importantly, who benefits from that uh, rather strange uh, outcome. Uh, so that's the lens that uh, I'm going to bring uh, to the questions today. Thank you, Bob. Steve. Great. Um, well, I guess just to remind Bob that if you do step out, don't stand up if you're working in your underwear at home. <laughs> um, so m my research over the last 15 years has focused largely around the Westray Law, which many, many of you have, are familiar with. Um, and I, I like to summarize what I research around um, the notion that I'm most interested in the topic of corporate killing. And it's always amazed me over the 15 years as I've looked at the evolution of the Westray Law. It was criminal code legis legislation that was implemented to hold organizations, corporations accountable for what we could say taking massive risks with workers' lives um, and people die as a result of it. What amazes me is that uh, now, 16 years on later, that law has basically fallen into a state of virtual disuse. Now, the United Steel Workers Union has worked tirelessly to uh, bring attention to that legislation and to ensure that, it's in, it, that it is enforced. Uh, my work has examined why it is that corporations continue to kill with impunity. And I think that's an important question for us to ask, not only socially, but obviously the important reason is because to hold corporations and hold employers accountable for killing workers means that we can hopefully get into a situation where workers' lives, lives are not put at risk. And so I think the paper that brought us here today, that brought me here today, was with my co-authors, Ashley Chen and Jasmine, Jasmine Iber, who felt um, passionately about this issue that they volunteered as graduate students to work on this paper. And with the support of the United Steelworkers Union, we set out to try to um, demystify or debunk the notion that there are a thousand work-related fatalities in Canada every year. And I'm sure it's a topic we'll talk about here a bit throughout, throughout this discussion, but the punchline for us is that we can, I think, quite confidently and conservatively say that the work-related fatality rate is at least 10 to 13 times higher than the thousand or so fatalities that are attributed to the workers' compensation numbers every year. So the problem is immense, uh, it's important, 
and it's um, part of our effort to try to turn the discussion towards um, taking this issue, as all of you in this room have done in your own ways, taking this issue more seriously um, so that workers can stop dying for a living. <clears throat> Thank you. That 10 to 13,000 number is one that really um, jumped up out of your research. Uh, and how many of us around here, around this room, use, still use the number of there are 1,000 workplace fatalities a year? How many, show me your hands. Does, do people say that? Jamie is the only one that, uh, Jamie West Sudbury MPP, by the way, uh, has joined us. Uh, glad to see you. Um, you have one fan. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, but back to where we were. Uh, so Steve, you, you used the 10 to 13,000 number which comes as a result of the research that we mentioned, so that catapults us into our first question. And, and let me pose it this way, so what is the current face, and we're going to talk about more than workplace fatalities, but for now, what is the current face of workplace fatality in Ontario and for that matter Canada? Um, what's recognized? I mean, what I mean by that is what What's recognized and by who as a workplace fatality? And, and, and what's the difference between injuries and diseases, even different types of diseases? We have cancer, asthma, uh, neurologic disease, and so on. Uh, we, like, so paint a picture. What's the story look like, Steve? Um, well, I, th I think the most straightforward way to answer the question is the face is much bigger than, than, than it appears in official terms. Um, you know. In fairness, the uh, workers' compensation numbers were never intended to be a system for tracking the number of work-related fatalities. As Paul said earlier this morning in his presentation, they track the number of deaths accepted for compensation. Um, but they have become the default way that we measure the number of fatalities in this country. Um, and that's problematic on a number of levels, right? First of all, it doesn't give us a true uh, understanding of the nature and extent of the problem, but as the ways that um, the number of fatalities changes, for example, as the manufacturing industry decreases, we'll see a somewhat drop in those uh, fatalities that are a result of that immediate traumatic event, and then more, we need to more un uh, understand even further those types of fatalities that occur 30, 40 years later when somebody has been exposed to something in the workplace. Um, so it's a complicated question to ask, but I mean the research that, that Paul and others are doing to expose um, those issues in terms of, of the causes of work-related fatalities and the links to cancer is important in that regard. Um, I think the other thing that, just as an aside in talking about this in terms of what the face of workplace fatalities is in this, in, in this country right now is I would turn to a cultural question. And, and that is, we, we tend to think of these things still in dominant terms as accidents. I'm somebody who is very much an advocate of getting rid of the word accident because it is largely uh, inaccurate in describing many of the situations as you were referring to in the, in the investigations that you did. When you look at the kinds of scenarios that people um, are exposed to and in which uh, they die from, whether that is, again, an immediate acute incident or perhaps exposure to some kind of toxic substance that ends up um, sickening and, and killing them down de well down the road. In each of these instances, when you look at the factors involved, very rarely can we, I think, call it an accident. Um, they are foreseeable. They should have been foreseeable. People knew things. Um, people, um, corporations covered up things. Uh, they knowingly withheld information. Um, so I think, you know, for us to start talking about the, the true nature and extent of the problem, exposing the, the face of it, so to speak, and finding a different language to call it for what it is, and that's why I call it corporate killing and not um, accidents. Uh, and I think that's, those are important steps along this struggle to, to bring light to these issues. Thank you. JP, what, what is the face of workplace fatality in Ontario and Canada? The face is a... Uh, a man at six foot six that walks into my office and has to tell me that he can't tie up his shirt anymore because he's got COPD. Um, 
So we calculate deaths simply by checking someone's pulse. But I could tell you, uh, Ruben, this guy wished that he was dead. So it's not just the numbers that we, we calculate or assume, but there's maybe double that or, or people that have absolutely no more quality of life. So that's something that we have to look at as well. It's not just a hard stop on, on checking out and, and, and going to some better place, but it's, it's being stuck in this place and not being able to do. So that's, that's some of the faces that I see uh, far too often. Thank you. Uh, Paul, how about you? And, and let me add to that. What, um, and let me emphasize, how, to, uh, how much are we missing? How do we know what we're missing? And what's the reality? And how do you quantify it? You said you're the numbers guy. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, for cancer, <clears throat> you know, we would say that less than, uh, less than 5% is captured by the uh, workers' compensation system. So 95% is missing. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, I think that's a... It's not really stretching anything. It's probably more than that that's being missed. Um, but certainly from the well-recognized sources of cancer and uh, historic employment patterns, historic exposure patterns, we know that you know the vast majority of those cancers are being missed. And I don't think it's unique to cancer. I think it's unique to a lot of our chronic diseases. But even, you know, when I was in uh, British Columbia, I was doing uh, research on uh, sawmill workers. And we have red cedar that we have there. And we looked at some of our red cedar workers. And uh, there were no claims always filed for these things. But uh, um, we were following people over the long term and then connecting them into the health records. And we were finding that people were shortly after their, their employment would stop. And, and a lot of these folks would be, you know, were dying of asthma. The thing is, it, with a system that is so painful to participate in, I, I'm not always sure that I would always recommend that people go through the pain of that unless, you know, I mean, even though I think it's important to get an accurate count, uh, uh, to participate in our, in our system is just not a, a, not a nice thing. I mean, even in, in British Columbia for a while, they really were, they had put in a program where they had an ombudsperson in for uh, for mesothelioma, and the idea, and it was because, um, you know, basically the workers' compensation system there, some of the executives attended a, a thing where they heard a lot of family members, and they were really moved by the fact that, you know, people with mesothelioma, the average time of somebody with pleural mesothelioma is eight months from being diagnosed to being, to die. And you really want to spend your last months or have your family during that period or even after you, after you pass away, have to deal with the compensation system. So they, they put in an ombudsperson to make that as painless as possible, and I think it really made a difference. But I don't think they've kept that program there. But that same principle, I wish, were applied to many other diseases as well. Um, so I, it's that, that missing the huge piece or just catching the tip of the iceberg, if we want to use that analogy, is, is not just restricted to to cancer, but to many different diseases, and yeah, for a complex set of reasons. Well, let's dig into some of those in a little while. Um, I, I mentioned the 1,000 a year fatality on, on the job uh, figure. Uh, last week, literally last week, uh, the, the Workplace and Labor Studies program uh, at Laurentian University, where I teach, uh, received a um, a grant from the United Steelworkers District 6. Uh, and Leo Gerard uh, was in town. He lives in town now anyway because he's retired. But uh, Leo spoke for a few minutes. And he used the 1,000 fatality a year figure. Um, and I winced because uh, you know, since reading uh, Steve's paper and, and a couple of others, I realized that number is, is, and I've always realized that it's a fraction of what it should be. But now at least we can say 10 to 13,000 based on uh, uh, Canadian research. So for the past 30 or 40 years, federal and provincial governments, workers' compensation and occupational health and safety bodies have claimed that there are about 1,000 work-related fatalities across Canada per year. But you know, now we have this 10, or at least we know it's closer, to the range of 10 to 13 on an annual basis, thanks to research. You know, if that figure of 10 to 13,000 fatalities annually is accurate, 
Um, the old standby number of 1,000 deaths a year is really flawed, and we need to be in a position to, to challenge the 1,000 deaths per year figure. So, Bob, I'm going to throw this one to you. Um, can you tell us how these figures are determined? And, uh, and uh, you and Steve, I think, are, are in a position to answer it. But can, you, can we leave this room and agree that we, we stop using that number? Apparently, some of you are ahead of the curve. Uh, so, Bob, take it away. Uh, sure. So, I mean, uh, a fatality uh, is obviously when somebody dies as a result of work. But it's only counted as work-related when the circumstances of that death uh, meet a fairly narrow and sometimes pretty arbitrary uh, work-relatedness criteria that's imposed by the state, by various levels and agencies of government. Uh, in Alberta, for example, if you die one step into your workplace, almost certainly your death will be considered work-related. And conversely, if you die one step out of the workplace, almost certainly it won't be work-related. It's more complex than that, but, but the key takeaway is that administrative rules uh, created by government uh, define when a fatality is work-related or not, and the rules are really problematic. So, you know, deaths that result from acute injuries, they're obvious, they're easy, they're almost always work-related. But some deaths obvi aren't obviously uh, work-related, right? So deaths caused by occupational disease, as Paul just mentioned, uh, aren't so obvious. There's a long latency period. Uh, workers often don't know if they've been exposed 30 years ago to something that might have caused uh, their, their illness or their injury. Uh, the causality can actually be murky, right? There can be uh, multiple factors uh, related to the development of a disease. And the data we have on the effects of chemicals and other agents in the workplace is really, frankly, terrible. Uh, and these circumstances create the opportunity uh, for employers and for governments and for workers' compensation boards to avoid labeling these deaths as work-related. And that reflects the political purpose of workers' compensation uh, and other injury-related systems, right? The purpose of workers' compensation <laughs> is to provide, and, and still is to provide, the minimum level of compensation that's necessary to keep workers from revolting from taking to the streets about the uh, injury and death of their co-workers. It's about maintaining legitimacy of capitalism and of the current government. So this system and the key <laughs> actors uh, in it have no inherent interest uh, in recognizing any injuries or deaths that uh, they can avoid recognizing uh, in this system. And in fact, it's in their interest to uh, under-report uh, and under-record and hide uh, as much injury and death uh, as is possible. Uh, because dead workers are awkward as hell to explain. But we can define their deaths uh, as not work-related much more easily, and then we don't have to explain why so many people are injured and uh, killed in the workplace. Uh, and I'll just finish up here, uh, because my wife said to keep my answers under four minutes, and she's very smart. Uh, you know, sometimes powerful groups of workers can force the issue. You think about firefighters and the recognition of their cancers, as uh, deemed uh, compensable injuries, right? Firefighters are a powerful group. They can fund research. They're viewed as, uh, they're politically sure. powerful because they're viewed as heroic and self-sacrificing. And there's nothing wrong with their cancers uh, and other illnesses being deemed uh, as injuries in our systems. But what it highlights is that other workers who have very similar exposures, uh, people who work in incinerators, for example, don't have their illnesses. I recognize, and it's because politicians simply don't care about them. They're not politically important. Uh, so I'm going to stop there. Thank I you. Just about the hearings? Go ahead. When I did the Freedom of Information request from the WSAB, one of the things that I found is they were tracking five different occupational disease groups, and the only one, though, that they had done the automatic compensation for were the firefighters because they, I mean, they have a great lobby group and, and good for them. Um, but they are perceived as heroes, right? If, if a police officer dies, a soldier, uh, you know, um, uh, firefighters, they're perceived as, as heroes, and we value them. And when you look at firefighters, they are heroes. They go into burning buildings, they breathe in tox toxic chemicals, you know, the roof can collapse at any moment. You have miners that go underground, they go into dangerous environments, the roof can collapse at any moment, they're exposed to toxic chemicals, and they don't have the same, you know, compensation, the same lobbying, that kind of thing. They're underground. We don't see them. They are out of sight, out of mind. And that's why we need to bring those to the forefront. And the other thing that we have for the thousand deaths, you could have somebody, even when they have an occupational disease, 
but they have that occupational disease, they have lung issues, they've, you know, they have silicosis and, and um, you know, COPD, things like that. But what they die of is their heart finally gives out after they've, they've done that for that many years. You have some sort of neurological disorder, you fall and hit your head because you can't walk straight. Well, you didn't die of the neurological disorder, you, you fell and hit your head. We need to change how we view the whole sequence of events from the time that they got injured. Yeah. That makes a big difference. Bob, you said dead workers are awkward to explain. Um, so, Steve, I'm going to throw this over to you, and I'm going to extend the question a bit. I'm going to say, and this actually comes from Susan Hart, the LAC co-chair. Um, our news media, and you've touched on it already, uh, our news media is rightly concerned about, for example, opioid-related deaths. But with all the opioid stories that we see, read, why don't we hear about workplace deaths? Should we treat workplace deaths as seriously as we treat opioid deaths, street crime, or even the m mistreatment of animals? Um, we, we see far more stories. Thank you, Susan, for that question. Susan pointed out, you know, we get more n news media about, about mistreated animals than we do about underground miners or uh, workers suffering from the effects of asbestosis or carcinogen that they work with. Steve? Um, yeah. Those are difficult questions to answer in many respects. That's why I gave them to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, look, you know, first of all, on the opioid question, by the way, I can't help but go off topic here a little bit. I mean, you know, I'm not so sure the media covers this in ways that's, that's uh, helpful. Mm. Um, you know, when I hear about the opioid crisis, I hear about a corporate crime because if we think back to the origins of um, Oxycontin and yeah. Purdue Pharma and the Seckler family, um, they've become extremely wealthy off of um, uh, legalized opioids yeah. that have created this crisis. And, and I would also add to that, again, somewhat off, to off topic, you know, there's a great work, I'm going to draw a blank on his name, Jeremy Malloy has done some work where he's talked about some of injured workers have become addicted to opioids um, and have had substance abuse issues in relation to their injuries. So. Um, take that what it means in terms of media coverage, but, but I do think that there is a problem generally that the media perpetuates about us thinking about these things, and when I say these things, incidents in the workplace that result in injury and death as accidents. That's a very strong cultural belief that we have that if something does happen in the workplace, it's unintentional, it was unforeseeable, it was not a result of negligent employers, that it was not a result of negligent working environments. And to borrow some of the language that Bob uses in his work, it was because of a lazy, dumb, stupid, clumsy worker. That's the kind of stuff that we tend to think about when we think about workplace uh, incidents and on, a, on, on, a, on a broad scale. And I think the media does, does perpetuate that as a reflection of those kind of, of cultural beliefs. Um, but yes, I do think that we should be thinking a lot more about these things as crimes, and that's what I uh, often write about in my own work. And I'm not uh, not going to suggest that calling these things crimes and treating, treating a lot of these um, fatalities as crimes would be a panacea for these things. Uh, but um, at the same time, there are, there are some real um, advantages to talking about the fact that these risks that were taken in the workplace were a result of negligence. And so naming them for what they are is important in that regard. But also, and this would be a larger, uh, more long-winded conversation, so I'll, I'll keep it short. But you know, in, in my world, in criminology, to speak about deterrence is seen as a bad thing. When you talk about street crime, deterrence is a huge failure. Um, but we don't talk about how deterrence would work for corporate crime. And there's every reason to believe that there would be a lot more success deterring corporations from uh, injuring and killing workers if they were held to account. And I'm talking beyond holding organizations to account, but actually holding the people who make decisions about how workplaces are structured to account for the decisions they make about how their workplaces function. And that is the senior executives, the boards, and even the owners and shareholders of the company. If they were truly held responsible for the conditions that they produce and result in serious injury and death, then I think the research suggests that there's every reason to believe that we would be m looking at a much different scenario than we are today. 
interesting uh, uh, point. Um, we've kind of answered the next question, talking about uh, how to determine a workplace fatality. So I'm, I'm going to sort of cut to the nub of, of, um, of this question and, and get at it this way. Canada has 13 provincial and territorial jurisdictions. If researchers are going to address pan-Canadian workplace fatalities, do we need a pan-Canadian definition of what exactly constitutes a workplace death? And if we do, what would that pan-Canadian definition of a workplace fatality look like? And who am I asking that? Oh, that Janice, how about you? I'll go with that. Yep. Yep. So if we think about this, because the, the kinds of uh, Netflix specials that my coworker always likes to watch are they, the crime, crime series, right? If you have a killer who is killing somebody by sudden death, which is basically what you're looking at, the thousand workplace deaths a year is basically what you're kind of looking at, sudden death, right? I, I shoot you with a gun, I strangle you, sudden death. Those are considered murders. It is also considered murders if you poison somebody slowly over time. These workers who are exposed to toxic things right now in the mines, right now in building trades, right now in, in a lot of different, you know, blue collar especially jobs, they are being poisoned by their employers, by, uh, they're allowed for this to happen because of the kinds of policies that are out there. So in, in Ontario, for example, the silica standard, you know, is tied to First of all, it's four times the international standard that I guess Ontario miners can, or or uh, construction workers or whatever can be exposed to four times the amount as somebody in Australia, uh, and that's okay. Um, but it's tied to the, the 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 ability to meet that regulation. It's tied in Ontario to to this. Um, you know, if the employer is able to do that, as long as it's economically feasible to do so, and that is a huge problem that we need to get away from. So if we're looking at workplace definition, it is anything in your workplace, whether it be something immediate like a uh, crane falls on you or something long-term like we're slowly poisoning you with diesel exhaust, we need to be able to define that as a workplace fatality. Doesn't matter if you die 30 years from now, if, you, if my husband's poisoning me slowly in my coffee from now for the next 20 years, he's gonna be held responsible for that. You're not seeing that being held responsible for, for the employers who are doing that. And it's happening right now, and I was, I was down at an October event, and somebody from a government organization came up to me and said, well, you know, Janice, there's never gonna be another General Electric. We don't have manufacturing, you know, um, big manufacturing in, in Ontario or Canada anymore. Those jobs have been overseas globally. And I didn't say anything at the time because I think I was just so stunned. And I thought, it's happening right now. Right now, we know that diesel exhaust from, you know, uh, the can cancer research centers and, and other, it, it, is a, it is a class one carcinogen. It is in the same category as smoking. And you have tons of workers right now who are being exposed to high levels of diesel exhaust. And they put, you know, the converters on or whatever, and they say that they get rid of 99% of it. Well, is that 1% the nanoparticles that are going to go into your system and, and wreak havoc in and of themselves? Those are the kinds of things and those are the kinds of questions that we need to ask to, to push for our, our definition of, of pan-Canadian workplace deaths. We need to change things. Interesting to hear, oh, thank you. It's, it's interesting to know that a government official thinks that unemployment is the answer to occupational health and safety. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous in the workplace. That's an interesting approach. Um, if we're not working, we won't be injured on the job. It's about visibility, and occupational disease is invisible. Somebody dies in front of you on the job, that's a visible, that's a sudden death. That is what is counted as a workplace fatality. Somebody dies 30 years from now in a, in a hospice, in a hospital, when their family's struggling to understand why, they, why this person got sick, when there is no family history of it, that's a workplace fatality, but they're invisible, mm. and they're vulnerable and we need to help them. To throw something else into the mix here and, yep. and try to branch both opinions. So we talk about the social aspect and what we believe as a community or as you know, what, what should be a, a fatality. 
And then we look at the, the legal aspect as well, and, and um, just an interesting fact, with the government of the day, of course, they, they put out this red tape challenge where every organization, um, government organization has to find savings. And, and one of them that was, that was approached, uh, of course, was the Corners, and the Corners Act was being looked at. In the mining industry, as well as forestry, we're one of the few industries that have uh, the benefit of having an inquest after a fatality. So on our push, and, and we have been uh, our local for the last number of years, to push occupational disease into the world of inquest. So one of the things that we had looked at is the Coroner's Act. Mm -hmm. And the Coroner's Act doesn't have occupational disease as a fatality. So even our legislation is is somewhat kind of our beliefs that I guess we all die need to die of something. So let's not define oc disease as that. Even our own legislation. So there's there's some changes that hopefully will happen around that, yeah. and hopefully the mining industry will will be one of the first to to investigate or do a coroner's inquest on an occupational disease. And I can't wait to see that day happen. Well, if there are any legislate legislators in the room. There's something you can take <laughs> to Queen's Park. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me move forward. Uh, and and uh, uh, Steve and, and JP, let's start with you. Um, now, I, I mentioned this earlier, and I said I wouldn't reveal the name of the law firm, but what the heck. Uh, the legal firm McCarthy uh, Tetro wrote this in their 2017 mining report, and it's a quote. The board, that's the Ontario Labor Relations Board, found that this overruling of an inspector's decision struck an appropriate balance between the risk of harm on one hand and the ability to carry out business on the other. The risk of harm on one hand and the ability to carry out business on the other. Now, since the Industrial Revolution, there's been a tension because of the balancing act between business making a return on their investment, a profit, a so-called, uh, uh, on the one side, and, and on the other, so-called reasonable measures to prevent accidents. So considering the careful balancing act between making a profit and guaranteeing workers' lives, workers' health and safety in the workplace, have we gone too far in one direction over the other? Steve, how about you? Yes. <laughs> um, yes, uh, and I think I think part of that what we have to understand in that context is the the sh the shift in the political economy over the last forty years, um, and 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 as what's often referred to as neoliberal capitalism, right? And what that has entailed has been a massive change in the relationship between employers and employees. And corporations today, and employers generally, but corporations, private corporations in particular, um, have massive amounts of power and wealth at their disposal. Right? So the balance that used to exist between employers and employees has been thrown totally out of whack. And as a result of that, at the same time that labor, organized labor and union have been put on their back heels for, for decades now. Um, and so I think as a result of that, we can really see that the advantage has gone to one side of the ledger. Cor corporations have always been about making profit. Mm -hmm. But in the last 10, 20 years in particular, that profit imperative has become so much more front and center. How much money can we make in the littlest amount of time possible? Um, and that's, pleasing, that's about pleasing shareholders. That's about squeezing as much profit out of, as, uh, uh, um, uh, of, out of things as, as we can. And as everybody here in this room knows, those are ingredients for workplace injuries and deaths. Every time that we want, a corporation wants to increase their profits, decisions are made that end up cutting corners around how workplaces are structured. Um, and so that, that is something that there's no easy answer to, but that shift that's, that, that has happened needs to, be, needs to be reversed. We need to have ways to give workers more uh, power and more decisions in their workplaces so, so, again, that we can stop sitting here and having these conversations about these things. I just want to point out that we talk about, um, we, uh, lawyers and law firms, talk about reasonable uh, measures um, to prevent accidents. Reasonable is their term. 
why don't we talk about reasonable levels of profit? I mean, by all means, you've invested, make a return on your investment. I'm not suggesting we're against profit. But why don't we talk about reasonable levels of profit rather than talk about reasonable, which means limited measures of making sure that workers are healthy and safe on the job? Why can't we flip the narrative, in other words? Bob, you look like you wanted to say something. I, I know? Oh, okay. Janice. Of all the questions that you asked, this is the one that I wanted to answer the most. And go, go for it. My dad's life is not worth any profit. Yeah. I am not willing to trade that for any profit. I want to live in a functioning society, in a society that is thriving in an economy that is thriving, and you can do that if you change your priorities. But the bottom line is the ground zero. Our lives are not worth it. It was traumatic to watch my dad, pieces of him being taken away. It is traumatic to our family. And if we look around this room and decide, these are statistics, right? It's a thousand workers. Maybe it's somebody else's family. Maybe it's somebody I don't have to think about. Maybe it's somebody who's on the webinar right now. I don't know their name. I don't know their status. Are we willing to risk that? Look around. If we say one a year, if we say one every four years, somebody in this room has to die. Look around you. Who's it going to be? Because at some point it comes for your family. It's going to be your child. And the guys on my registry that I talk to, they show me pictures of their grandchildren. And they say, you know, I know. I lived my life. We had lots of money. I bought cars. We went on vacations. And then this happened, and I would trade all of that back. And I can't help my fate, but I want to make sure that my grandchildren are OK. And we are going to fight to make sure that that happens. And the only way you can do that is just show those faces and tell those stories. Miners, blue collar workers, they're hardworking. They're proud of their work. I'm proud that my dad was a miner. I'm proud of what he did. I wish he wouldn't have given his life for us, but he did. So I'm gonna give my life to make sure that this doesn't happen to other people. Sorry. Thank you, Janice. Steve, did you want to add to that last question? Uh, I, think, I think Janice's words um, say it all. Um, and, you know, if, if a company can't be run safely, if a company can't guarantee that its workers are given every opportunity to ensure that their workplaces are safe, then I'm not sure what moral grounds that company has to exist. And I think that's the, the real question for us to consider is that, you know, this is a very difficult question to say how much life, how much is a worker's life worth, but I think Janice's very heartfelt response tells us that we have to do so much better in order to address, um, uh, in, in order to address these issues. The risks that are taken are routine and they're part of most workplaces. And so we've got to somehow find a way to change the narrative on that, for sure. Here, here. Absolutely. On that sobering note, let me turn to you, Dr. Bob. Um, in your book, The Political Economy of Workplace Injury in Canada, this is what you wrote. And I quote, governments do a poor job of preventing injury. The use of ineffective regulation appears to represent intentionally prioritizing profitability over safety. And the state, the government in this case, the state has contained the ability of workers to resist this agenda by shaping the discourse around injury and the operation of these systems. So Dr. Bob, what do you mean by this? Sure. Uh, well, so first, uh, thank you so much uh, for reading my book. Uh, that puts you in very <laughs> rare company. 
Uh, and my thought, uh, as I hear you say that back to me, is that uh, 2010 Bob was uh, appreciably smarter than 2020 Bob. But I'll uh, I'll give it a stab. I'll, st I'll take a stab at uh, answering this question. It seems like there's three parts uh, to that statement. Uh, the first is uh, that governments do a, a poor job of preventing injury. Uh, so here in Alberta, the biggest number of injuries the government talks about are disabling injuries, about 44,000 a year. Uh, when we surveyed uh, workers, 2,000 workers a few years ago and asked them about their injury rate, uh, what we found uh, was in fact there's about 408,000 injuries a year in Alberta uh, in a workforce of just under uh, uh, 2 million people. So that's basically one in five workers a year has some kind of occupational injury. Probably the same this year. Um, and that's, that's essentially a, a, an indicator that the injury prevention system in Alberta doesn't work. And the numbers in other provinces are gonna be a little different, but they're not that much different, right? None of our injury prevention systems do a very good job of preventing injury. So that's the first part of the statement. I think the second thing I said was that governments uh, prioritize profit uh, over safety. And, and look, safety costs money. I know people like to say that safety pays, but the truth of the matter is it, it doesn't pay, right? If, if corporations are profit maximizers and safety paid, how many injuries would we see in a year? We would see zero injuries or pretty close to it. Uh, what we see uh, in any jurisdiction are tens and sometimes hundreds of thousands of injuries reported and unreported uh, each year. And that happens because employers can externalize the cost of injury onto workers and taxpayers, and to some degree, even onto other employers. So what really pays uh, is in fact uh, a lack of safety, uh, or in fact, what really pays is injury. Uh, and the state could change the calculus uh, on that by fining companies that kill workers into oblivion uh, or jailing employers that maim or kill workers. But the state doesn't do that. Uh, so what the state is doing then is it's allowing employers to trade our health uh, for employers' profit. Uh, and in that way, the state is prioritizing profit over safety. Uh, and I think the third thing uh, in that statement was the state constrains our ability to resist that through uh, discourse and the operation of systems. So uh, two examples of discourse, uh, one is the careless worker myth, uh, where we frame uh, injuries as a result of accidents, right? Injuries aren't the result of an accident, they're the result of an employer placing a hazard in a workplace and exposing workers to it. That's not an accident, that's quite intentional, but the framing is always accidents, the accident fund. Uh, a workers' compensation system, for example. And uh, the state's data collection processes define what an injury is in a way that radically underrepresents the true level of injury. So they're knowingly, the government is knowingly hiding injuries and death from the public. And in that way, they're controlling the discourse. Uh, what we think an injury is, how many injuries we think occur, uh, and how we talk about it. And the operation of systems reinforces that. If you just think solely for the moment about workers' compensation, if you get injured and you're lucky enough to be able to file a claim and have your claim accepted, that's great. But now you're at the mercies of the workers' compensation system, which at any moment can review your claim. So you're not likely going to make a big stink about health and safety if you're a claimant. Uh, if your claim gets discontinued, uh, sorry, denied, then you have to go through an appeal system that's stacked largely against you. That's bureaucratic. It's uh, draining. And if you act outside of that system, likely it's going to scupper your claim. And if you do act outside the system, and maybe you contact your MPP or your MLA, depending on your jurisdiction, they just say, you know, file an appeal, go talk to the ombudsperson. They have a get out of hassle free card here. So what we have then is basically a system that forces us through its operation to go along with a very user hostile experience that often doesn't result uh, in any effective change to the circumstances that gave rise to the injury in the first place. And that's my four minutes. <laughs> um. I'm, I'm going to throw this one to uh, three of you, and JP, I'm going to start with you and Paul and, and Janice uh, will follow. Um, and this goes from, from the uh, top-down picture to individual cases. So how do we improve recognition of individual cases? And I think some of you have touched on this already. Um, it's, it's the problem not only workers' compensation regimes, boards, WSIB, and uh, the ministry, but also under recognition by physicians. So, JP? Well, there's, there's three things that we could dive into that for sure. So the, un, the, 
the physician problem is, is huge. Mm -hmm. um, not only just for diagnosis, but just to treat people that have a workplace injury. Um, listen, if, if you think the compensation system is, is rotten towards workers, uh, it's worse towards physicians. And, and I had an earful from one of the physicians in town. Um, Mr. Chesey was talking about uh, NEL assessments and how the board got rid of their, their NEL doctors and thrown everything onto the physicians. These physicians aren't equipped with that. And the type of work that they're asking them to do is, is two to three hours of their day. This particular physician ripped me a new one, uh, and very politely, <laughs> but basically saying, I get paid 15 minutes. I can't, I can't do this. I really can't do this. So at the end of the day, this injured worker is, is left without an assessment. The doctor wants to help, but he just, he just can't give up two hours, three hours of his time to do that. So that's one, one big issue is, is um, a way of controlling that is you, you starve. You, you, you provide so much work that it can, cannot possibly be done. It can't. Yeah. And, and we're seeing that uh, in, in, in our world, in Ontario, the WSIB as well. There's the, the government of the day has reduced the employer's premiums. They're giving back uh, free money if they just apply a little bit of safety. And what that has done is, is really cash strapped the WSIB. So in turn now, we have to provide the same level of service with less money. And, and the result of that is wait times that are astronomical, where we used to get a decision for noise-induced hearing loss, for example, in from four to six months is now 12 months. A phone call, for example, where we used to wait three minutes to speak to somebody is now 13 to 20. So again, a, a way of controlling that is, is starve it. Starve it, and then now, now we're, we're navigating the system that is even more frustrating for everybody. Injured worker, physicians, people that want to help, it's just a, a, an absolute struggle. And to go to, to a point where you talk about the appeal process, an OCK disease case, for example, uh, um, will last about eight years. From start, if you go through the appeals process right up to the tribunal, is eight years. Uh, a meso prognosis, 12 months. Most of the people I represent are widows. Shameful, terrible. Paul, I'm going to throw the same question to you. Uh, how do we improve recognition of individual cases, but also under recognition by physicians? Well, and we do need to, you know, to start at that level, we need to improve medical education. But it doesn't help if the physicians don't have time to do it or if we don't have a system with other people in the healthcare system who actually take the time to, to really take a medical, uh, medical history on people. Uh, you know, we've talked about trying to add in occupation and industry into the electronic medical records so that at least something is cataloged somewhere. Maybe then we could add on tools that would assist the physician to know that if a person is in this occupation, you should be on the lookout for these kind of diseases. Because it's, it can be more than just that kind of early recognition can actually impact survival or improve people's treatment as well. So the earlier we see these things, the more important. But it's not, uh, it's not an easy thing to do, and there hasn't been our medical schools now don't really dedicate much time to that. Uh, even though we've been, there's a number of people that have been calling for it for years. And, it, and we can't leave it to the specialty clinics either. Mm -hmm. it, we want to catch things early. And the person who should know the most about you is your primary care provider, should know what you do and, and uh, those kind of things and how they can impact your life. I, yeah, so I, I don't have an easy answer for it. Uh, we were hoping for one. Yeah, <laughs> it's a tough, it's a tough question, uh, but it takes resources. It takes resources to do that. One of the gentlemen that you're you're probably making reference to, and, and I'd be uh, subdued and not even mention his name, is Dr. Noel Kieran, and he was a, a, an OCAL doctor for a long time, and he's one of those bulldogs that have really pushed for an occupational disease center of excellence. And, and his vision is to have an endowed chair to not only look at, at a center of excellence to treat the occupational disease, but the, the, the schools. And how do we reintegrate occupational medicine 
into the University of Toronto or NOMS, and, and it's this great identity on, on theory, um, but we have to start with the chair, and, and uh, that's a, it's a battle that's been uh, going on in the province for, for a long time, and I think we have to revisit the way that we educate our, our uh, treating physicians. Thank you. Janice? I think one of the problems is just physician awareness. If you, one of our OCAO doctors actually teaches at a university and he said, he teaches medical st school students, and he said there's, throughout their whole, I mean, you know how long it is to get through medical school, and throughout that whole time they have one three hour lecture on occupational disease. One three hour, one three hour lecture. And that, and that was just added in, um, you know, in recent years. So if they're not aware, that these factors might be occupationally related, how are they going? How are you going to get the numbers? How are you going to? How are you going to pick that up? Um, you know, if we're not researching and and uh, monitoring the exposures, we're not going to make the connections for physicians to even be aware of that. There was a program. Um, There's a rise of um, coal miners lung again in mm -hmm. the uh, the progressive massive fibrosis down in the states, and um, uh, I believe it was NIOSH, um, which is one of the um, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, uh, had identified, um, basically they missed 95% of the cases that were out there of this progressive massive um, fibrosis because they were looking at, they were monitoring, their monitoring programs were minors who were um, still at work out-of-work minors were going to clinics in the Appalachians, you know, uh, Virginia, Kentucky, whatever, and they saw, they were, they, in, across 16 clinics, I think they picked up close to 2,000 cases, um, and, and uh, there was 90-some that were picked up by NIOSH. So you have to be educating physicians in those communities where you have the risks and exposures in order for them to pick up on what's going on in order for the larger picture to see, my God, we've got 2,000 cases, not 99 cases, um, in order for, for change to happen. Um, I'm a former industrial worker and, and to this day I, I still carry some of my old injuries with me and I can't remember the last time I was asked by a medical professional what my work history is. I'm sure that's the same for many of you. That's changing. That's changing. I'm part of the Ontario, uh, the Ontario Health Study. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Ontario Health st Study. So about 10 years ago, they decided to just get, ask for volunteers. If you lived in, on, in Ontario, you could volunteer to be part of this, to be a research subject. And you, a you ask all these, they, they ask you all these questions you answer them. I decided to be part of it because I thought it was important. And just last year, we got notification, um, oh, we're, we want to know what, where you worked. And that was 10 years down the line. They never asked me anything about where I worked when I first started the study. Well, now they've got a whole research thing and they're pulling in, where did you work? And I know that that's happening because of all of the pressure that everyone is in this room is putting on them. The research that, that some of these researchers and, um, are doing and, uh, and people, um, you know, who are standing up and being activists, so thank you. Thank you, Janice. Um, th this is the last question before we go on break at 1.30, so we're gonna have to keep it, I, the four minute rule I think should be imposed. Um, so, uh, and, and JP and, and Steve, uh, this is gonna go to you and Janice. Um, recognition by the workers' compensation system is important for individual families and social justice. There's no doubt about that. But focusing only on that gives power to the compensation system to control the picture. We've already talked around this. How can we switch the focus to the real picture? So we know the problem, you know, an over too much focus on the compensation system. How do we, how do we refocus, JP? Well, I, I propose two, two things. Um, one, one's a big challenge, and it, it's because it falls under privacy laws. Uh, and if we look at occupational disease, for example, and occupational disease fatalities, a person that dies of lung cancer, lung cancer is a medical condition. So we can look in the abits, and you see a whole bunch of people that you know, lung cancer, lung cancer, 
Nowhere does it say it's occupationally induced lung cancer. And last year, for example, um, our local, we, we had 10 ca cases, WSIB cases that were approved by the board of occupational disease. 10 of our members died. Now, if 10 of our smelter workers died, the operations would be shut down, absolutely shut down. There'd be no end of money funnel to get the smelter up and running. Whatever was needed to get things done, it would have happened. But 10 of our members died and nothing happened. So it's convenient um, that we, the board and, and everybody could hide behind the fact that this is medical. We, we can't really bring that. So we started a project a couple of years ago and I was, I was talking to my colleague, uh, Dwight. Um, we have a memorial park. There's a beautiful park in Elliott Lake where they actually post the names of people that have an accepted claim. And again, we're limiting ourselves to accepted claims. The picture is much, much more. But just to get that to happen, we have to get consent from the family, all of that. Um, traumatic fatalities have the benefit of the next day the name is on the front page and it's there for a week and um, people really stop and, and reflect and how do we avoid this but we don't have that luxury in occupational disease. So the other thing too is, is uh, medical. So like I said an occupational disease could take up to eight years to, to get accepted. After it's accepted, of course, the worker would receive medical benefits. But for eight years, he was on taxpayer dollars. Really, he was going through the OHIP system. All of that stuff is being paid. And, and at the end of the day, when the, when the claim is allowed, is the hospital or the OHIP system saying, here's a bill for Mr. ABC. You owe us uh, 375000 for this day and all of that stuff. Maybe what we should be doing is you presume to be work-related, send all the medical to the WSIB, and if the case is not allowed at the end, well, then the WSIB could repay OHIP, but right now it's the vice versa. Now, if the, the cost, mm -hmm. if the cost really outweighs the benefits of cutting corners, they'll change. And the way to, to promote that cost is, is charge it on the WSIB right away. Someone comes in, COPD, initiate the claim, everything will be paid by the WSIB. This is my, my dream. And then reimbursed, if so, then you'll see a big change, yep. a huge change. Yeah. Maybe the bill should go to the employer. I mean, this is a part of corporate welfare, right? We're subsidizing employers with our tax dollars funded through OHIP, through social assistance. If it takes eight years to have something heard, you've got EI and social assistance in there as well. Um, I mean, there are a bunch of government benefits that are paid for with individual and corporate tax dollars when the bill might, I mean, this is the problem. We focus on WSIB or workers' compensation boards far too much and not enough on, um, on the workplace, the owner of the workplace. Right, the, the owner of the profit-making enterprise. And can. those are just the direct costs, the yeah. direct health care costs. You're not looking at the impact of these families have now split up because somebody's off and they can't afford their rent or their mortgage yeah. and it causes marital stress and the impact on the kids and, and all of those things. There's, there's a whole lot of other things that come from that basic hierarchy of needs. So tell me, Janice, how do we switch the focus away from WSIB and compensation systems to the real picture? Well, we they've got the legislation locked down pretty good. They, they're an entity under themselves. They can, you can't take them to court. You can't sue your employer. You can't join class action suits. You've got rubber workers down in Kitchener who were exposed to the same thing at the same companies down in the States. They all got class action lawsuits and won. Up here, you can't sue them. Instead, you have to go to the WSIB who denies what, 85% of the claims, something like that? It's, a, it's a, like a ridiculously high amount for, and I was at that rubber workers clinic with OCAL. Thank God for OCAL, because it really, the, the occupational health clinics for Ontario workers is a workers or a states in, in Ontario, and I don't think that there is a comparator in, within Canada um, that they can go to and say, look, this is what's going on, and have, a, have an eyes outside of 
this iron lock WSIB because you have your only, your only other option is the tribunal and you go to the tribunal and it's great that we have the tribunal which is your appeals court um, but you can't uh, the WSIB in, in my freedom of information documents they the, the law was changed so that um, if the tribunal cannot overturn a decision that the WSIB makes in accordance with its own policies. That allows the WSIB to write policies to bind the hands of the tribunal. So that is not a fair or just system because you don't have that. So you have to go outside of the system. You have to gather the numbers to, to show the critical mass of people who are out there in order to affect change and push for change in the system. And those are the kinds of things that need to happen mm -hmm. because they, they have all the power and when you have all the power, you need to rebalance that power. And that's what we're going to do. That's what we are doing. Good. Steve? How do we refocus away from compensation systems? So recognizing the important points raised about the compensation system and the problems that there are with them and all the things that need to be done to change that. I think outside of that, um, that legislators, elected officials, should be held accountable for enforcing the laws that they're responsible for. And I think the one thing that we can look at right now on those two levels is, as you mentioned earlier, we have a system of regulations in place that are questionable in terms of uh, their effectiveness on paper, but certainly questionable in terms of their enforcement. And that's not to suggest that um, inspectors are not trying to do their job, but they are, um, woefully under-resourced and are not given credit for the work that they do. Mm -hmm. Regulation, again, over the last 40 years, regulation has become something that's seen as a four-letter word. Um, there's, there are laws in place that are supposed to protect workers in that regard. If those were taken more seriously, then we would be in a, in a scenario where more prevention could be. I also think that because it's an area of work that I have focused on extensively over the last 10, 15 years, is that we have to do a much better job of enforcing the criminal laws that are in place for dealing with the scenarios in which massive risks are taken with workers' lives that are a result of negligence and for which there is almost entire impunity. I mean, if I was to tell anybody that there was criminal legislation on the books, criminal code legislation, that deals with a very serious offense, right? We're not talking parking tickets, we're talking negligently killing somebody in the workplace. And that there had been a grand total of a half a dozen or so charges in 15, 16, convictions in 15, 16 years. And even if we use that very conservative estimate uh, of a thousand workplace fatalities over the year, over those, uh, each of those years, you don't have to be a mathematician to understand that something's wrong there. So um, I think if we start focusing as well on those external kinds of uh, that regulatory context and actually demanding that the laws be enforced accordingly, that that would be an augment that would be an addition to struggles over the compensation system itself, too. Uh, sorry, the, just the thing he was saying about the Ministry of Labor inspectors and stuff—they're handcuffed right now. They changed the what's the. the I may be a little out of the loop, but it's something like the accre new accreditation system that you can be like an accredited employer and you can just kind of self-regulate. And as long as you meet that criteria, then they can't come in and do, do um, you know, uh, unscheduled workplace inspections, proactive workplace inspections. That's, that's BS. Yeah. Um, you know, and e even when they have these, you know, the spo supposed to be surprise inspections, all of my guys tell me that we were, when they were in the mines, they knew exactly when the inspector was coming. You had to close down this dangerous area. You, you suddenly, everything was cleaned up. Suddenly, you didn't have the water dripping on your head all the time. That's BS. Yeah. Just, and, and just one quick follow-up point. We have that. one minute. Yep. yep. Uh, there's not a lot of research in this area, but we know from the UK, for example, that there's every reason to believe that about two-thirds of fatality cases involve some form of negligence. Mm. So if we want to think about that in terms of, again, enforcement and holding people accountable in relation to the number of actual charges and convictions there are, um, I think, to me, that raises some serious questions. Cert most certainly, um, it makes a mockery of our justice system to have such an important law in place that goes unenforced. And that has to be part of the conversation, you know, doesn't it? At least in my mind, it does. It does, and it, uh, if negligence is that high, and I don't doubt it, it calls into question what we call an accident 
isn't really an accident. So with that, it's 1.30. I have to thank all of you for a wonderful opening half. <laughs> when we come back from our 10-minute break, um, I promise you we're going to have some fireworks because we're going to discuss the internal responsibility system and its flaws. So make sure you come back after the break. So let's take 10.